Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I am Eitan Sontag from the State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, CSO. I'm excited to be moderating today's discussion, which will focus on the overlapping challenges and the opportunities of humanitarian assistance, uh, security and stabilization, and development and longer term peace building in Mali. This is the so called triple nexus. Before we launch, I wanted to thank my colleagues uh, at the World Bank uh, for organizing the virtual Fragility Forum 2020. Um, our excellent panelists here today, uh, of course, all of you tuning in on YouTube, and especially my colleague at CSO, Oz Alturk, for helping to organize today's uh, discussion. Um, let me maybe say a few words to frame um, the conversation today. Um, for more than eight years, Mali has endured a, a deadly crisis as armed factions, including jihadists, ethnically aligned groups, and transnational criminal networks have competed for control of territory, resources, and governance in various parts of the country. Conflict dynamics have also been exacerbated by climate change and environmental stress, which disrupt livelihoods and other economic activity. In addition to the security, environmental, economic, and social challenges, there continues also to be significant political turbulence in much of the country. Some of this manifested uh, recently by large demonstrations uh, in Bamako last month, with the prospects of additional ones later this week, in fact. Further complicating all of these dynamics, of course, is COVID-19. In support of the Malian government and armed forces, a host of other foreign armed actors operate in the country, including uh, the UN's multidimensional integrated stabilization mission in Mali, MINUSMA, the so-called G5 uh, Sahel Joint Force, French troops supporting the counterterrorism focused uh, Operation Barkhane, and now uh, the international task force Takuba. The 2015 Agreement on Peace and Reconciliation in Mali is supposed to be the guiding roadmap for the resolution of the country's violent conflicts. However, as of today, it remains largely unimplemented, including on key pillars related to disarmament, demobilization and reintegration, national dialogue, development, and others. The one-year renewal of MINUSMA's mandate on June 29th, just a few days ago, repeatedly underlines that the lasting peace and security in Mali and the Sahel more broadly can only be achieved with a deliberate combination of political security and development efforts that benefit all of the regions of Mali. So how these threads come together or don't come together uh, in addressing Mali's challenges is precisely what we want to hear more about from our expert panelists today. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our four speakers. Um, His Excellency Ambassador Mahamadou Nimaga, Ambassador of Mali to the United States. Ambassador Visa Williams, Special Advisor to the Carter Center, which serves as the independent observer for implementation of the 2015 agreement. Lubna Benhayoun, Director of MINUSMA's Stabilization and Recovery Division. And Cyril Thomas, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel in the French Army, currently serving as the Defense Liaison Officer to the French Development Agency. With that, what I'd like to do is turn to each speaker to provide some brief opening remarks, which we will then follow up with some questions. So let me first turn to uh, Ambassador Nimaga. And Ambassador Nimaga, can you hear us? Uh, is OK? Yes. Can, can you hear me you. now? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Etan. I would like to um, uh, say good morning to everybody uh, and those who are uh, listening to us uh, uh, this moment. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, the uh, State Department and the World Bank for inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, today's discussion is uh, particularly interesting for me 
as it covers uh, relevant and important uh, issues for Mali. Uh, you can remain assured that I will carry your view, comment, and recommendation uh, to the consideration of the government of Mali. I would like also to thank the United States, French, and other members of the Security Council uh, for supporting the renewal of the mandates of the MINUSMA for one year. Malian citizens and government do always welcome uh, the continued international solidarity toward our country. While I'm aware that our national and local responsibility to make peace, to bring stability and hope to our people. Efforts to achieve peace are duty to all Malian citizens and institutions. In this spirit, President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita remains full committed for a shift implementation of the Agreement on Peace and Reconciliation, which called Accord d'Alger. Process. Uh, since its signing in 2015, the president has directed successive governments to accelerate its implementation because he is convinced that there is no other way to achieve lasting peace in Mali. So from the beginning, we were aware that many challenges were led ahead. However, we did not anticipate it will take so much uh, time and missed opportunities to turn dark page of our history. So for the beginning, uh, as a remark, I would like to stop here and uh, we'll develop the discussion when the questions come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Nimaga. Um, if we can, let's turn to Ambassador Lisa Williams, please. And just a quick. Yes. Good morning. Excuse me. I did the exact same thing as Ambassador Nimaga. Uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, the people of the World Bank and also at the Depart U.S. Department of State for including me on this panel. Uh, for the last two and a half years, uh, I have led the Carter Center's mission as independent observer of implementation of the peace accords in Mali. And the, the fact that, that, there, that there is an independent observer, I really think must be highlighted and recognized. It is very important. It's the very first time in any peace agreement in Africa that the parties have written into the accord that they wanted an entity or they wanted someone to verify that they would meet their own commitments and that the other side would meet its commitments. And that in itself, on the one hand, an indication of the reluctance of the parties to come to the peace table, but also of their commitment to say, we'll go forward if they go forward. What we have observed over the last two and a half years um, has been very slow, um, uh, slow movement and in implementation. And we have published reports indicate, identifying what we think the obstacles are. Some of them are technical. Most of them we have found over the first two years at least were really um, uh, a weakness of political will. And that is something that uh, we have discussed with all the parties and uh, consistently, particularly this year, uh, the parties have reasserted um, their intention uh, to move forward. Uh, one one uh, critical aspect that we think that this uh, peace agreement really needs, implementation needs, is, in, is inclusion of more members of civil society, particularly the views of women. Uh, and all of those elements now are being discussed. There seems to be a convergence in uh, on that issue. Uh, and we will continue to travel around the country, meet with the parties, report what we see is going on, and identify those kinds of steps that we think would be helpful to advancing the process. Uh, so I think I'd stop there and wait for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Williams. Uh, let's now turn to um, to Lubna um, on the ground in Bamako um, for um, some opening remarks, please. Good uh, morning or good afternoon, everybody. I also would like to join the other to sincerely thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, panel uh, with such a distinguished uh, panel of experts. Um, I have to admit that uh, this event is uh, extremely timely 
as far as uh, MINUSMA is concerned. Uh, because indeed, uh, the UN Security Council just recently uh, adopted the renewal of the mandate for another year, that is to say until the 30th of June 2021, which is a very, very important step. Uh, this mandate renewal actually is taking place amidst a highly challenging and complex geopolitical and socio-economic environment, not only in Mali, but in the Sahel region as a whole, therefore affecting millions of people and livelihoods. In fact, MINUSMA as a multi Lubna, I think we may have lost your audio for a moment. I don't think we can, um, I, I can't hear you currently. No. So while we try, uh, hopefully our technical specialists will be able to um, to help resolve some of the audio problem right now with Lubna. Um, and in the meantime, let's maybe very quickly move over to Cyril, if we can, um, to give um, some opening remarks, and then we'll come back to Lubna. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to resolve the the audio issues there. Thank you. Stand by, Lubna. We're going to come back to you. Yeah, I'm Cyril. So, good morning, ladies, gentlemen, and thank you for the invitation. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you know that following the post summit at the beginning of the year, uh, the French military forces and the Agence Francaise de Développement have been uh, tasked to revitalize, to beef up, to embolden their coordination to obtain optimized results in their respective fields of actions. So from the military point of view, the question is, to what extent can we integrate or take into account in a better way the action of the AFD to our campaign plan? What synergy coordination can be implemented so that both organizations fulfill successfully their objectives? What is at stake is that the gains obtained during the kinetic phases, the military operations, have to be capitalized to some extent and transformed by the actions of civilian organizations, NGOs, AFDs, so on. What we accomplish must, be, must not be done in vain, but with the perspective for the military commander that peace will be built by others. Having said that, we also strive to share some uh, good practices from previous engagement. We have three rules of war, as you know. Concentration of efforts leads to a multidimensional approach. Liberty of movement leads to, uh, instead of focusing on the urban cluster, try to envisage a special currents, taking into account some corridor of activities such as Gao up to Mopti, Gao Kidal, Gao Ansongo, Chilaberry up to Niger. This is another way to uh, envisage and have the prospect of development too. And the last and third rule of war is the economy of force, which is the partnership, which is essential, which is, which is based on local programs and planning, such as the Maliko plan, which is orchestrating the redeployment of security forces in uh, security bubbles. So we can translate to some extent those rule of wars also in the development and the further actions that can be uh, undertaken after the, the operations that Barkan is conducting. Excellent. Thank you, Cyril. Uh, we're going to come back to you on a number of these questions that relate to the role of the military and how the military buttresses uh, political and development efforts. Um, but first, let's come try to come back to Lubna and see if Lubna's um, uh, audio is, is back on and whether we can hear you. Lubna, over to you. Can we hear you? I think you're on mute still, Lubna. Oh, 
both yet. Um, we will continue to try doing that. But um, while we try to resolve that technical issue, I'd like to come back and um, ask a, a couple questions of, of each of our speakers. And maybe if I can, let me start with Ambassador Nimaga. Um, first of all, thank you for the opening statement um, underscoring the commitment that the government of Mali has to implementation of the agreement. And also, I think, realistically noting how long and how difficult and challenging um, implementation may be. Um, as you know, public will is an important part of, of stabilization. And so I'd like to sort of hear from you in terms of what the resolutions from your government's inclusive dialogue amongst Malians uh, do you think are most critical to implement? Um, that's that's one question. Another is um, if you can comment on sort of what the recent unrest and turbulence in Bamako um, perhaps signifies for broader stability across the country um, and for the implementation, of course, of the 2015 agreement. Um, let me leave it. Let me leave it there with those two questions, um, and we look forward to hearing your uh, your response. Over to you, Ambassador Nimega. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, let me very clear as much as possible. There is no doubt on the political will and commitment of the President Ibrahim Bouwakar Keita to ensure completely and entirely a shift implementation of Accord d'Alger uh, and the peace and the reconciliation. As you know, Mali is a, a democracy where public opinions is very important. Uh, we cannot run the country vive out to support our uh, political and uh, civil society, religious, traditional leaders, including women and youth. Uh, it, I should recall that for the constitutional reform, the President Keita had to postpone the process twice, in 2017 and 2018, because it's protest. And subsequently, we have decided to hold at the National Inclusive Dialogue in December 2019. In addition to this dialogue, as you have witnessed, the last days, the President has conducted very intensive consultation with the all political, social, and religious leaders in the country, as well as from the Sahel and the ECOWAS region, with the aim to appoint a new cabinet. As you have noticed, over the week, the president following a meeting with political leaders is making an offer for a government of national unions by proposing to all the political sensitivities to rally the new cabinet in order to conduct the necessary reform that can avoid similar episode for our country. I remain confident that the implementations of the relevant recommendation of the National Inclusion Dialogue and the additional consultation will be reflected among the key priorities of the next government of Mali. As you mentioned that we, uh, during the National Inclusion Dialogue, partition, participants have recommended that certain aspects of the peace accord be revised. This is acceptable because three years after its signing, many important provisions of the accord were yet to be implemented. You will recall that the government had made many concessions in hope that we will reach a system of peace with our brothers. But Malian people has realized that not all signatories are working with good faith in implementation of the accord. Uh, Biza highlighted that uh, the implementation is going uh, slow and it needs to be accelerated. Uh, it's important to note that in many instances, the monitoring committee has voiced an intent in recalling parties' responsibility on that issue. How one can imagine 
for five years, some parties are still undermining the deployment of the reconstituted army. How can we effectively fight terrorism if still there is no unified army to defend national integrity and ensure security to security the civilian population? So there is no doubt we are aware that there is any alternative in peace. And our president, uh, in all occasion to the international uh, conference, he recalled that the peace accord is the only way for Mali to move forward in progress, in development, and security. I'm going to stop here. And then if there are other questions on that, we can uh, develop it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Nimaga. That's very helpful. Um, let's try to um, come back to, to Lubna in uh, Bamako, who I think just um, tried to dial back in to, um, to regain her audio. So Lubna, if you can hear us, and hopefully we can hear you, let's, let's turn back to you, please. Lubna. Okay, Lubna, if uh, perhaps you're muted. Okay, still nothing heard. Um, we'll keep trying with Lubna. Um, th this is a this is a, a a real world example of some of the challenges uh, in communicating, uh, especially when you are sur le terrain um, in Mali from time to time. So um, moving to um, Ambassador Williams, uh, a couple questions for you. Uh, you noted the lack of political will. You noted uh, the delayed timeline uh, in terms of implementation um, as just a couple uh, as just a couple of the challenges, including this issue of broadening inclusion uh, and in particular um, the role of women uh, in in building. Uh, national consensus and facilitating reconciliation. What I'd like to know is what elements of the uh, of the accords of the agreement must be prioritized in what sequence uh, over the coming 12 months and who bears the most responsibility to take action? That's one question. Another that I'd like to um, hear your thoughts on are um, given the the failure to implement many elements of the agreement how can the peace process move forward without undermining the prospects uh for stability writ large in mali over to you ambassador williams thank you ethan um well first of all those two questions are very very late um so my the answer i think for one is might be the same as might lead to the other uh, there is no question in our mind that the, the way towards stability in Mali is implementation of this peace agreement. In fact, most recently, within, I guess, about a week ago, um, there was a mission from the ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, to Mali, and, and those leaders, those representatives also reaffirmed the importance of implementation of this peace agreement. Uh, so the region understands how important it is. Malians understand how important it is. Uh, and I, I think the idea that implementation might somehow undermine stability, I think that is in fact one of the arguments that critics of the agreement propose, but it does not seem to be the consensus in the region. Given that aside though, so then what needs to be done? I, I do think that, uh, not just I, but Beryl Carter Center believes that uh, all parties are responsible for this. And so that, so that uh, when we talk about political will, the lack of that is equally shared. The lack of the slow implementation clearly um, is equally shared. Um, but if you want to identify what needs, what can be done, what should be done within the next 12 months, Ambassador Nimaga very um, accurately pointed to the security situation in Mali. And a main element of stopping a rebellion and forging a peace is the demobilization, demilitarization, and reinsertion or reintegration of former rebels 
into the security sector, those that want to be, or back into society. And D the DDR has moved very, very slowly. There has, it was moving so slowly, the parties decided to have a jumpstart accelerated DDR, which also haltingly got underway. There are now five years after signature of the peace agreement, about a thousand persons who have been soldiers who have been nominally reintegrated. But in order for them really to participate, as and I agree with uh, Ambassador Nimaga, and participate in helping to secure their republic, helping to re secure uh, the people in Mali, um, those integrated soldiers need to be given equipment. They need to be fed. They need to um, be given missions. So what's happening in, in the DDR process, for example, what has happened uh, is uh, a, a half step uh, in a, a nominal move in taking people on, but not a full integration. Culpability on both sides, resistance, reluctance, a low rank and file of the army, um, perhaps lack of resources, maybe they don't have the money for cars and equipment, but um, uh, and also some some missed signals with among the movements as to who's going to who's eligible, who can go into the forces. But all of those issues um, actually with uh, some clear direction and some real political will on both sides, in our view, could are, are resolvable, are easily resolvable. So so I would say DDR is, is it definitely within the next 12 months must be um, something that is acted upon. Not only to send the signal to the people of Mali that the the agreement is still viable, uh, but also that all parties cons are concerned about their national security. Another thing that I think that really needs to happen within the next 12 months um, has to do an important grievance of the people of the North had to do with political representation. And there was and and, and um, decentralization say in what happens in their regions. Um, there were steps toward that. There, there is to be a new chamber of uh, the, the National Assembly. There were to be elect. There were elections held to to uh, to get regional representation, uh, representatives to the National Assembly. However, two of the new regions that are a consequence of this accord were not yet ready to even participating in voting. To get to the step so that actual political grievances and or um, local constituents can have local communities can have some say in how their they are governed um, and how their priorities are met interim authorities were established in the accord and were initially established right after its signature those interim authorities haven't been given also the wherewithal to do their job nor has the political aspect of their job really been activated in other words there's still a cadre of the leadership from the rebellion who were um, who are making all the decisions about what needs to happen in these communities instead of letting these communities get the practice of 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 local governing so the interim authorities need to be re-empowered to do the job which is to be the voice and the arm for the communities that they represent and those communities in order to really um in order for the nation to see that things are progressing you have many dis internally displaced people in Mali as a consequence of this rebellion. You also have many refugees, Malians still living overseas in refugee, uh, not overseas, but uh, in the bordering states um, in refugee camps. There needs to be an effort to bring those refugees back home um, so that they can live in their communities, so they can rebuild their lives. The people need to see in the North and in the South that their conditions of life are changing and changing for the better as because this accord is being implemented. And in our view, that can only um, cement uh, stability in the country. Um, so part of bringing back the refugees and, and it, uh, internally displaced persons, um, bolstering security and having your integrated force really execute security measures so that they so people can see we are part of the protection of our whole nation um, goes to the point that also Ambassador Nimaga mentioned, which has to do with what does national reconciliation really mean? How much, dis how much discussion has there really been 
among all uh, the people in Mali um, to address what were real human rights violations leading up to and during the rebellion, uh, a, a, a national recognition of the suffering of people and what what the nation is going to do as it comes together um, uh, uh, to overcome that, to, to move beyond that. So those kinds of discussions uh, have not gone on, need to, need to go on, and I think would be very important um, to improving stability uh, and would show a national effort uh, to advance. But they're all, they're all anticipated in, in the agreement. And, um, and I, in our view, they're all doable within the next 12 months. That's great. Thank you, Ambassador Williams. Um, I, I'm sure uh, many of your comments have piqued uh, additional questions. Perhaps we'll be able to um, come back and address some of those uh, as we give others a chance to speak. Let me um, quickly uh, try to uh, come back to Lubna um, and see if uh, the audio uh, is up and running on her side. Lubna, over to you, I hope. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. I know the the network has been very capricious here. This, yeah, over the last days, anyway. Well, sorry about that. But um, as I was uh, initially saying, that uh, the, the the renewal of Minusma's mandate is extremely uh, important, and it's a uh, and timely. Um, uh, and it's focusing on two main strategic priorities. First of all, it really supports the implementation of the peace agreement. That, that's the main priority. The second one is to facilitate the implementation of the st strategy of stabilization in the center in a comprehensive and politically led manner with a, with a view to protect civilians, reduce intercommunal violence, re-establish state authority, state presence, and provide basic social services. And in doing so, MINUSMA is expected to continue to carry out this mandate with a robust, flexible, proactive, and agile posture. This is, uh, this is of course, uh, considering the fact that MINUSMA is not alone in this endeavor in supporting Mali. It is working hand in hand, collaborating, partnering, and, and uh, coordinating with a wide number of, of partners, whether within the UN or outside the UN, uh, to make sure in a very concerted effort for with, you know, in full dedication and, and commitment towards the durable peace, stability, and long-term socioeconomic development in the country as much as in the region as a whole. Therefore, uh, the idea, I mean, the, the concept of stabilization, which has, as you all know, has long been a, a subject of controversy amongst, amongst partners as definitions differ and approaches differ. In the, in the case of MINUSMA, I can I can uh, state that it has been translated as a politically led concept that serves as the basis for political strategies to resolve conflicts through a comprehensive approach using both military and civilian tools. And this why this is why, of course, the the whole idea of having this compendium or a melting pot of interventions between the between the humanitarians, uh, the development actors, as much as the military actors, is absolutely essential. I will stop there, and I I accept your your uh, your the questions. I hope you heard me this time. Uh, thank you, Lubna. We heard you. Uh, we heard you loud and clear. And I especially appreciated um, your point um, of uh, emphasizing that stabilization, uh, insofar as it's viewed um, through the lens of Minusma, 
is a political concept that is supported by these various um, tools, whether they're developmental tools or, uh, or military tools, but ultimately it is a political endeavor. Um, let, me, let me turn to you for a couple questions before we come back to, um, to uh, uh, Colonel Thomas. I, maybe you can talk a little bit more about the implications of MINUSMA's newest mandate renewal. What, what in that uh, new mandate is especially important, whether uh, that relates to new, um, uh, to new tasks, um, to new responsibilities, or perhaps even to a roadmap of defining benchmarks for the eventual anticipated exit of, of MINUSMA. Um, uh, is there anything that you believe is insufficient um, uh, in the mandate um, to, to, to work with uh, partners in Mali to transform c conflict dynamics? So that's one sort of grouping of questions. The other is, Maybe you can also speak a little bit more to how MINUSMA is playing its role to bring this comprehensive approach together. In other words, how do you sequence and fuse uh, humanitarian action, security and stabilization, um, and longer term peace building and development efforts? Um, you know, where does, um, where does MINUSMA play its role in terms of trying to sequence and coordinate uh, across those various um, sometimes messy uh, lines of effort. Thank you. Um, uh, to be honest, actually, there is, the, the, there, is, there is no need for a fundamental shift in terms with the, with the new mandate. However, uh, MINUSMA still needs to act in concert with this man, with, within this mandate in order to have this ongoing adequate, and it is on adequate response to the crisis. Uh, therefore, it definitely should continue uh, the, its leadership in the conduct of political and institutional reform. Uh, uh, the, the, the importance of good offices by uh, the, the special representative of the Secretary General is absolutely key, has been key throughout uh, this very uh, volatile or difficult moments we're, we've been going through. So uh, it's extremely important to continue this, this, uh, this work in order to address the root causes of the crisis, such as improving global governance, uh, strengthening the rule of law, improving the justice sector, the electoral system. These are various factors that are also mentioned to justify the current political and, and social uh, tensions in, in Bamako recently. So basically the recommendations in order to ensure an, an effective uh, stabilization strategy uh, would be that uh, stabilization uh, and it's clearly uh, outlined in the new mandate. Stabilization to support the return of state authority, state presence, that's, that's, that's key. Uh, resolve the engines of conflict and lay the basis for, for peace building. Stabilization could, should be seen also as a, as a tool for strategic planning and pragmatic solutions to conflict and instability for the UN system while also looking or uh, taking into consideration and respecting the comparative advantages of each and every UN entity or organization. Uh, stabilization should also uh, uh, be based on both territorial and uh, holistic approach while addressing the political uh, and legal reforms. So uh, also the issue of national and local ownership and participation, uh, like uh, Ambassador Williams mentioned, yeah, inclusion of everybody in the civil society, women, youth, everybody is really the idea of an, an inclusive process is extremely is essential. Um, also taking into consideration gender uh, uh, into account. But one, one element that's also coming out clearly with now, with after a few years of, uh, of, uh, of course, mandate renewal, uh, 
the issue of joint analysis, joint planning and monitoring and evaluation amongst the various actors, this is an essential uh, area that, that all the partners need really to, to focus on and to work on. Uh, um, uh, increasing the coordination or strengthening the coordination efforts uh, also between the various actors, not only at uh, central level, but also at, uh, at regional level, uh, state and territory. And territory. Uh, other ideas that could also be flagged out to, to the, of course, to, to the partners is this flexibility of financing mechanisms, uh, which is essential to, to make sure that the nexus approach is really well uh, met. In order to to looking into the cyclical and structural needs of the population, one size fits all solution is not an answer. There needs to be a, a, a differentiated approach depending on the the areas, depending on the needs, depending on the uh, economic uh, situation, depending on the socio political etc. So there is a need for this. Uh, 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 very deep analysis, conflict analysis that needs to be to be also done by all the, the partners and and making it as a as a joint effort. So uh, the development of a for a better a better working method based on this joint analysis and joint planning in order to reach uh, collective achievements and and joint follow ups is 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 very essential. Um, so these are basically elements that are coming out more um, that could be used during this uh, year's mandate resolution to really focus more on these issues of uh, partnership building, uh, uh, jointly uh, uh, making our jointly effort, joint efforts, joint analysis, but more not only in words, but more practical, more uh, uh, more and more operational, let's put it this way, because we also know that, uh, you know, um, partners, we all have our mandates, our approaches, etc. But there needs to have there needs to be a little bit more interaction and and flexibility amongst all all the partners to go to come back to your uh, to the other question. Uh, what the, the role uh, MINUSMA is playing uh, across the, the, the nexus or the triple nexus area. Actually, uh, MINUSMA has been extremely fundamental and through the stabilization and recovery section has been very instrumental in really pushing forward the, 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 the approach because uh, they were uh, different, uh, different um, uh, talks within within the partners. Not everybody was, of course, especially with the humanitarian uh, partners, as you can imagine. The idea of having the, the military part in this nexus was not a consensus amongst everybody. So they would, there was the need for a lot of pedagogy, I should put it this way, to make sure that, you know, one humanitarian or development cannot work without any military uh, support or military uh, yeah military support basically so the 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 intervention of in the operational mode of minusma is actually very much in line with this triple nexus why because minusma is insisting on issues such as restoring order creating and maintaining a safe environment uh, implementation of full implementation, or we can we are trying of DDR process uh, by this community uh, violence reduction interventions, restoring uh, public institutions and services, promoting good governance and institutional accountability, reconstruction of infrastructure, revival of economic and social activities to a number of. Uh, project or program activities, uh, restoring social cohesion, building public confidence. So MINUSMA is really working in a, in a real, is a wide realm of interventions or, uh, or pro projects in order really to, to, to attend the, you know, this, what the Nexus approach means really. And, and, and as 
uh, a part of the coordination of the technical and financial partners, MINUSMA plays a crucial role being in the complete uh, to improve or to find improvements uh, in terms of coordination and also in terms of complementarity and synergies between all the partners. So MINUSMA together with, with France, for instance, in this case, uh, uh, in the in the um, in the uh, one of the commission, it's called Commission of Rehabilitation of Post Conflict Zones, is is a is a very interesting forum or, uh, where whereby these ideas of uh, complementarity and synergies between partners, whether humanitarians, development, and government partners are sitting around the table together and reflecting on. Uh, who can have who have the comparative advantage to do this type of program or project in this particular area so there is a there is a, 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 a you know this forum that's, that's playing a very important role and we need to keep strengthening this efforts of uh, looking into you know complementarities avoiding duplication seeing where each and everybody's uh, financial mechanisms, operational procedures, etc., are more uh, in line with the re the reality in order to uh, to achieve results. So the, without competition, but working really together, hand in hand, and looking at complementarities. Over to you, Lubna. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, excellent uh, intervention in response to those questions. I think many of the points that you just made um, touch on um, some of the the best practices and the principles. Uh, I know that uh, the U.S. government, um, but many other governments have also espoused when it comes to um, addressing issues of stabilization and fragility, um, such as uh, uh, a real focus on root causes. Um, to help bridge um, the phases from stabilization to longer term development and peace building, um, the central uh, importance of local ownership, uh, the um, critical nature of, of joint planning and analysis, um, and the flexible funding uh, mechanisms, all things that uh, I think have been repeatedly cited in conflict and post conflict areas. As, um, as fundamental to uh, achieving progress. Um, so thank you for that. Let me maybe now turn to, um, to Cyril to follow up on his initial statement. Um, I think um, we're, uh, as many others have alluded, there is a, an almost dizzying array of, of armed actors um, uh, and groups um, uh, many from within Mali itself, but many um, outside of Mali. I mentioned a few of those at the outset, uh, you know, beyond, of course, MINUSMA. Um, there's uh, Operation Barkhane, the Task Force Takuba, French forces, etc. cetera. Um, and so um, a, few, a couple questions for Cyril. How, how are the profusion of these armed groups coordinating and at the very least ensuring that they do not work at cross purposes and that they are supporting the political um, endeavor of stabilization. Uh, one question there. Another is that, you know, some critics have suggested that counterterrorism operations are ultimately more destabilizing and can feed into terrorist or um, violent extremist organization recruitment narratives. So how are French forces or other armed actors um, that you are working with uh, trying to address those kind of concerns? Uh, over to you, Cyril. To answer the first question, uh, Ethan, every organization, I guess, has a clear mission, uh, as uh, Lupina just explained for the MINUSMA, be it the local national armed forces or French forces, Barkhane. As we are concerned, we have uh, a lot of uh, personal staff embedded in the different headquarters and at the different level. Um, and as far as Barkan is concerned, you know that our mission is very clear. It is to neutralize the VEOs and especially the uh, IGS in the, the Liptekogoma area, 
where we are also in this area working very closely with the, the Malian Armed Forces, the FEMA, but also with the, the task force of the G5 Sahel. And every time, every actions, operations that are conducted by one of these structures is supported also uh, with the, the, the capabilities of uh, the, the Arkan. So there is a real connection, support, uh, embedded personnel to emphasize the uh, the, and, and uh, support the, the operation. So it does exist, and uh, and we do have great partners. We are very much uh, uh, happily surprised with the, the the fantastic results of the G5 cell uh, task force, uh, which has achieved some uh, very good results on the ground. The second mission of the the Barkan, uh, where we have also to link with our other partners, is security force assistance from advising at the ministerial level to combat operation. And uh, in this field too, we have shifted also. We have already uh, moved to a, a different, uh, to a, a bottom-up approach. Before, up to last year, we were more or less in a top-down uh, advisory uh, uh, stance, uh, but it's not enough. Uh, it will always be important to connect the bottom of approach with the top down approach. Be it, it is ministerial advising and with a combat operation. And we shifted and we moved to uh, to train to organize some mobile elements in the in the, the provinces that are very much different from the battalion that were trained in uh, Kulikoro. But they are complementary tools for the, the Malian armed forces. So we always learn. We always learn. And what we have to learn too is that it's not only about structures that we have to talk, but as in any society in France or anywhere in the world, we have to identify the right person with the will and the motivation. And after a few years of actions in, uh, in Mali, and it is always the same, you come even more to identify those person that will be the real uh, a leader, whatever the organization sometimes they belong to. But coming back to the people, not only to the, the fund that you give, uh, the planning, because without those people who really want to make things evolve, you will not achieve anything. For example, last week, uh, with Barkhand's uh, support, the French, uh, the, the, the Malian Armed Forces have uh, Display have launched a first mobile uh, column that is dedicated to uh, help uh, the Malian state government to uh, to redeploy in some uh, uh, some region where they have been absent for a long time. This first column went uh, deployed to La Bezanga with the the governor, the prefects, and uh, following that some NGOs come back. So we always have to connect with what the Malians are ready to do. This is the starting point. No need to come with pre-work solution that uh, we would take from our different countries. Just help them and support them because they need support for sure. But it is possible. It is possible. And it is the same for everywhere, for everything. They have their own plans, such as the Maliko plan, which is dedicated to the redeployment of the Malian armed forces, we have to stick to this plan. We have to support them because it is pretty much well done, well solved. And uh, they just need, of course, this uh, material uh, financial support to launch it effect e e efficiently. But it is there. It is there. And with just small support, they can transform and they can relaunch this Maliko plan that was uh, there for during the, the for the last elections. So, what I would say, yeah, to link this top-down and bottom approaches and to take into account the local plans. Nothing is perfect, but this is the best starting point on which we have to stick and to uh, to plug in to uh, to help them. And the last mission of uh, Barkan, as you know, is uh, nonetheless is to enable and facilitate the actions of development uh, actors. And this is important. Uh, 
if we can contribute to win this war, we will not uh, win the peace. We will not build the peace with our military assets. Uh, but this is the same uh, shared desired end state that we have with uh, AFD, NGOs, and MINUSMA. We do not express it in the same way with the same words, but this is the same. Your second question about the counterterrorism actions. Yes, we do intervene in 2013 to counter those terrorist groups, which have evolved in the meantime. Uh, they are more numerous, they have expanded geographically, but still they are the main threat, one of the main threats to the state, to the Malian state. Um, I just would like to remind you that we re-emphasized this counter-terrorism efforts at the end of last year, where three uh, um, garrisons in Mali and Niger were uh, attacked and uh, the, the, the soldiers were slaughtered in the in Yates, in Deliman and Bulkesi, emphasizing that those, uh, those groups, those VAOs, had gained in power, had beefed up, so something had to be done. We cannot let them uh, uh, be an alternative to the state where they are. We cannot let them to thwart any stabilization process. So it's not the alpha and omega of the, the solution. It's not the ultimate answer. And we will not deal with any with uh, all of these videos in the same way. Uh, every every video has its own uh, particularities. Uh, they may have uh, connections with political movements. They may be uh, purely uh, autonomist or religious. They do not have the same agenda. And it will never be the same answer that will be applied uh, to tackle uh, this and to neutralize these VEOs. Yeah. Um, that th those comments are um, extremely uh, illuminating um, to hear sort of how both the coordination takes place um, across these various um, armed groups, whether it's uh, Barkhane, Minusmar, or uh, Takuba, as well as the mission um, of, of French forces there. I think one of the things you said um, about basing um, uh, military activities off of the local plans is especially important. Um, given that we only have a couple minutes left, I just wanted to um, offer uh, a, one last opportunity for Ambassador Nimaga um, to um, perhaps address something that we've we've all been talking about a little bit in different ways, which is what else can the international community do? Um, what should it be doing? What should it be doing differently, uh, perhaps to facilitate stability uh, in Mali? So um, Ambassador Nimaga, I think we have about uh, two minutes. Um, so maybe if you'd like to briefly comment on that and then we will close up. Um, thank you so much. I would like really to um, appreciate uh, what have done by the Barkan and the Minusma. We do believe that uh, Malian people are very appreciative uh, of the international community. I quickly in the peace accord, I know uh, uh, in different way we are highlight that uh, the peace process is going slowly, but sometimes people undermine underestimated the effort of the government in the particular context. You have the security situation is difficult. You have also the COVID-19 is coming. And also you have the fragility in the old state. So, and also we are working that the government and the administration come back in the entire territories. So uh, in that way, we are very grateful for French forces and the Minisma and in counterterrorism way. So what I would like also to highlight is uh, Four years, MINISMA has been supporting our countries in many aspects of stabilization. And they were really uh, where it's still a long way, but we cannot imagine how many, how Mali would be if MINISMA was not present, if Barkan was not present in this particular in the terrorist uh, <clears throat> um, context. So uh, what we want from the international community is to maintain pressure and to all signatories parties to fulfill their commitment. It's important to say that uh, the peace agreement is not going well, but what, we, what is the responsibility for the international community to assist the Mali to achieve in this process? That is also very important. And uh, 
it's very clear in the report of the UN Secretary General, they appreciate the efforts made by Malian government. The political will is there, but without, when we talk about inclusive, the national dialogue, uh, inclusive national dialogue is participating in this framework and all the parties, and we welcome also and appreciate the participation of the movement signatories in this national dialogue. And the recommendation should be implemented for all Malians. So uh, we want really from the international community to maintain pressures, but also we want more financial support to help accelerate the implementation of the peace agreement. Particularly, it's in COVID uh, related to political and institutional reform. As you mentioned, Ambassador Visa, DDR, in the development field also, justice and the reconciliation process. We are equally concerned by the situation in central Mali. And we need more support to our holistic national strategy for stabilization in this country. So I think as long a part of our territory is controlled by terrorist group, it will be very difficult to ensure security to our population. That is why re-establishing the state authorities all their entire territory remains an important priority for us. This is also why the state must play its role as strategic to think, to design, shape, and implement its development agenda. We are appreciated for all the support we have been receiving. However, the role and the responsibility should, be blur, should not be blurred. Indeed, the partner cannot replace the state. The state must remain at the center of the agenda. And it has been enabled to play fully its regalian role by providing security and shelter to its citizens and coordinate the donor support to the country. To be able to do so in the most effective way, we will need our partners. We need Munisma, we need Barkan, we need the, the international community the USAID and other partners to help us strengthen the state capabilities for it to more enable to meet the needs of the citizen. This is the only way we will be able to address the grievance at the root of the conflicts and implementing the terms of peace agreements in the timely and the transparent, and the transparent fashion. So this is, uh, I will stop there. And I don't know if we have few words to conclude or not or I may conclude from that. Thank you, Ambassador Nimaga. That um, is an excellent uh, resume of, um, of what else the international community uh, may be able to do um, in partnership. And I, I would underscore that word partnership um, with, uh, with not just the government of Mali, but all Malians um, as, as it will require a whole of society effort um, to facilitate the implementation of the agreement yeah. um, and to, to help um, also expedite stabilization and longer term peace building in Mali. Um, I, I want to very quickly um, acknowledge that we have received some questions um, from outside. Unfortunately, we don't have time to take those questions today. Um, we hope to have a second part to this event. Uh, in which we will be able to curate some of those questions coming from our, our viewers and put those to you, our expert panelists. So that is for part two, um, uh, part two of this uh, of this expert panel. Um, I would just uh, like to again quickly reiterate my thanks to the World Bank, um, to you, our panelists, uh, to audience members. Um, uh, you know, for your contributions and your insights. I think that what's clear is that there, there's a vision, broadly speaking, of where we want to head um, collectively in Mali, um, but perhaps still um, differing views of how to get there, on what timelines, um, how do we uh, continue to reinforce the very important partnerships that are necessary uh, to uh, make progress on stabilization and, and longer term peace building in Mali. So with that, um, let me again thank everyone. I appreciate your time uh, and, your, and your inputs. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you again in uh, part two to go a little bit deeper uh, into some of these questions on stabilization uh, uh, in Mali. Thank you very much, everyone, um, and look forward to uh, 
um, the next uh, version of our conversation. <laughs>